Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we're going to do another review on the economy and see what's going on, starting with uh, what is the NFL telling us about the economy? So a lot of the conventional wisdom out there is talking about how the economy is going to have a quick recovery, a V-shape recovery, whatever. But the National Football League is indicating its leadership isn't so confident. So the NFL Commissioner, Roger Goodell, he announced deep cost-cutting moves for the league, including employee furloughs and pay cuts. Part of that pain can be seen in extending debt limits. So the NFL and club executives, they agreed on a proposal to raise the debt limit for each team from $350 million to $500 million beginning in the 2020 season. So in a memo to employees, the NFL Commissioner Goodell, he outlined broad cost-cutting steps across the league. Other measures include pay cuts for office staff and furloughs, reductions in contributions to the pension plan. At this point, we all kind of expect unemployment rates to to continue to increase. But the pension plan, we've been talking about this on the podcast for a long time, highlighting California and Illinois specifically about um, how much trouble their their pension plans are. We're going to kind of see that balloon everywhere, not just Illinois and and California, but everyone is going to have a decrease in revenue. That's from taxes, that's from just a normal business activity. And so therefore, with the drop in the stock market, that's already going to be a catastrophe. A lot of these pension plans need 7% just to break even. And so with the negative GDP and some of the, the economic collapse that we haven't seen yet, including the, the next leg of the stock market dropping, um, we could see pension plans suffer a lot in the future. Right now, 42 million unemployed, 25.5% unemployment rate. That's a record 20.5 million jobs that were lost in April, 10 times more than the depths of the Great Depression, resulting in a 14.7% unemployment rate. So that pushes the effective number of unemployed to 42 million and the effective unemployment rate to 25.5%. And it looks like May's incoming data is consistent with the baseline that we've been seeing. So it doesn't look like at this point that uh, the, the May's unemployment data is going to show an improvement or even stability. So with the record number in unemployment, we're also seeing job openings plunge most on record. March saw a drop of 813,000 jobs. That's the largest on record going back to 2000. The number of layoffs and discharges increased for a total of 11.2 million With everybody getting fired virtually, nobody has an interest in voluntarily quitting right now. We're seeing those numbers drop significantly to the lowest levels since 2015. With layoffs and uncertainty, there's a lot of people liquidating. So you're seeing an immediate liquidation from over-leveraged Airbnb hosts rushing to dump homes. And so there's a whole lot of people that have an excessive amount of uh, rental properties, and they're just liquidating those immediately. So you've seen a lot of these over leveraged hosts they are just about one or two months away from foreclosure. So a lot of these people are putting their houses or condos on the market. They're about to flood the real estate with properties they can't afford. So we saw the core consumer price index crash by the most on records, and yet food costs are soaring as energy and apparel collapse. So we saw consumer prices fell 0.8% month over month. That's the biggest drop since 2008. And soaring food inflation was dominated by plunging energy, apparel, and lodging costs. But the core consumer price index at 0.4% month over month made the headlines. It was the biggest monthly decline since records began in 1961. Gas prices, for example, declined 20.6%. It was the largest contributor to the monthly decrease. The food indexes rose in April, with the index for food and home posting its largest monthly increase since February of 1974. So with a lot of these, you know, meat and protein packaging companies, Tyson and everyone else having to close because of the Rona, that's going to increase the cost, decrease supply, obviously, you know, economics 101. So Tyson has come out and said that they're not going to increase the price and actually decrease the price to try and help the consumers uh, as the supply kind of dwindles down with a lot of these being shut down and cleaned up. So shelter or rent inflation is up 2.6%. It's the lowest since February of 2014. Rent inflation is up almost 3.5%, but it's the lowest since January of 2019. 
I don't think this is taking into consideration that there's going to be rent strikes, mortgage forbearances, um, all of these issues where people aren't going to be paying. So we're going to get into some of that in just a moment about some of the derivatives market and the commercial market collapsing, which will hit the residential market. And so all of this isn't really giving us a leading economic indicator. Uh, it's just kind of showing us year over year, month over month, what's happening with rent inflation. Uh, but it's really not taking into consideration systemic risk uh, coming from everywhere. We're seeing a lot of unemployment as well as the insecurity that goes along with that, the uncertainty. So U.S. slides into a depression, and yet consumers have never been more bullish on stocks. It's my opinion that we've been desensitized. We've been made to believe that the market always bounces back, that the stock market always comes back, and that housing always comes back. The latter is is interesting because housing has never dipped before. So it dipped once and came back, and then all of a sudden everyone just thinks it's going to rebound, so buy the dip. In the stock market, the market does go up, but that's only because it's being manipulated. Stocks that aren't doing well are being pulled out, and other stocks are being put in. So they're just reallocating that index, so it does go up. But the stocks that are inside are getting annihilated. We covered that on the last podcast where the highest concentration in history is just five stocks. The other 495 stocks in the S&P are still down 13%, even though it looks like the market is up because five stocks are, are bringing the majority of the S&P to a 10% positive. We're in the black, which was all times high. It looks great, right? Well, no. In terms of commodities, the average U.S. consumer is not expecting that their uh, assets are going to increase in value. So, for example, over the next year, consumers are expecting gasoline prices to rise 4.9%, food prices to rise 5 medical costs to rise 9 and the cost of college to rise almost uh, uh, 5%. So on the other hand, the average consumer is expecting that the stock market prices are going to rise in the future. According to the New York Fed, the probability that the U.S. stock prices will be higher one year from now surged to 51%. It's above 50% for the first time ever and the highest print on record. That's a red flag to me. Anytime you see that much positive sentiment from people that, that think that the price is going to go up, uh, it just means that the, the pendulum is ready to swing the other way. Again, we haven't had supply chain disruptions yet. We haven't had a financial impact yet. This has just been simply a corona impact. So we're witnessing the greatest monetary inflation, an unprecedented expansion of every form of money, unlike anything the developed world has ever seen. You can't print trillions of dollars and not have any negative repercussions. So it's, it's going to be a tidal wave and it's going to come hard. This graph here of the E-minis S&P futures is showing just how we went down due to the virus and then with the Fed's printing money and having uh, BlackRock buy uh, high yield junk bonds to ETFs and everything in between, uh, we've just gone right back up to all time highs with uh, the Fed's buying stocks now. So is it just the Feds that are buying stocks? It's definitely not really institutional investors. They're trading. Uh, they're definitely not holding their positions, but retail investors are thinking that they're going to be able to buy the dip. So let's take a look at who's buying stocks here and who isn't. So not only are institutional investors not buying, but their positions have turned even more bearish during the April-May period, causing a lot more pain and even more losses. And predictably and similar to Warren Buffett, you have hedge funds remaining out of the picture. So in short, nobody at the institutional level is buying and yet stocks continue to soar. Why? Well, for one, volumes have plunged, making it easier to push around stocks with options or odd lots. It's also easy for price indiscriminate buybacks. You've got Apple's $50 billion stock repurchase. So I know that they just announced an $8 billion debt round. So they're going to issue bonds in order to buy back their stock. Absolutely insane. And at the same time, all of the funds who jumped on the short side, confident that it was finally over, have gotten crushed amid the biggest short squeeze in history. And with short interest plummeting back to all-time lows after a modest increase in March, shorts got steamrolled, but the feds are going to step in and buy ETFs. So it doesn't really matter. So the institutions are selling. The high-frequency traders are flat. Hedge funds, they're bearish. But volumes and liquidity are down. Buybacks are surging. Shorts are getting crushed. And yet you have a retail investors that are flooding the market and making a killing, at least according to Robinhood data. This is like 2018, 2019, when retail investors were delirious with visions of fortunes and early retirement, only to see the market trap door fall beneath them. 
So this could mean that the next trap door could open as soon as institutions have distributed enough to the retail investors and the next stop, according to Goldman, would be 2400. And looking at this graph from 2019, showing the S&P levitates higher even as investors pull money from the stock funds. It's not entirely impossible. That disconnect always ends with stocks catching down to the flows. It's only a matter of when. But nobody's really buying stocks and nobody's really buying bonds. In fact, they're liquidating those bonds. So in order for the government to keep printing trillions of dollars, they need to have a buyer on the other end of that. And if foreigners are dumping a record amount of U.S. treasuries, then who's going to be the next buyer? You're seeing here that foreign holdings of U.S. government debt fell in March. And now the Treasury reports are showing a total foreign ownership of treasuries dropped by the most on record. So this is also a monthly record sale of U.S. treasuries by central banks and a record sale by uh, foreign private investors. And in aggregate, it was a record month of selling for all U.S. assets. China is the second largest holder of U.S. government debt. Their total holdings sank $10.7 billion. And Japan, still the largest pile of treasuries outside of the U.S., had a value that rose to 3.4 uh, rose 3.4 billion to a total of 1.2 trillion. Saudi Arabia, on the other hand, dumped a record 25 billion in U.S. treasuries, which makes sense since the petrodollar is completely gone. I believe it was like 1974 when we the U.S. went out to Saudi Arabia to uh, get the petrodollar in place so where Saudi Arabia would sell oil for US dollars and only US dollars. And so that helped with the velocity of money and getting uh, our currency to be dominant, even though it wasn't backed by gold. So that arrangement was annihilated when Obama had made Iran the head of OPEC, which really upset Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia started accepting uh, all forms of currency. And in fact, they just went public. So Saudi Aramco is a public company now. Everything is different. So it looks like Saudi Arabia is switching their focus. They are dumping treasuries and picking up a lot of gold. A lot of other countries have repatriated their gold from the U.S. back to their home country, and they're buying masses of amounts of gold. These are uh, not only just federal reserves and banks, but countries, sovereign wealth funds, uh, the elite. Everyone is picking up gold and silver. It's important to look at precious metals because the government is just turning out that the money, just putting the printer uh, on high. The Fed is now buying bond ETFs. So an exchange traded fund uh, isn't a real company and bonds are debt. And so they're literally buying this debt that's just been kind of pulled together in tranches and then resold. And so I would just say, let those speculators uh, fail. Uh, it's, it, if you're going to be printing money excuse me, currency, and then paying off, off debt, real tangible assets um, for a company that doesn't even really exist to save who? Speculators? Why? This is insane. So Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker, has a new $3 trillion package she wants to, uh, to throw out. And so every time the feds print money, they're diluting all of us who still have money. So you can see that with the purchasing power, how it's decreased to about three cents right now. And you can look back to even like 1960, you could buy a house for about $7,000. Uh, the average person was, you know, that's their annual income was a house. So by that standard, we should all be making three to $600,000 a year. But our salaries haven't kept up, which is even more important why you should be focusing on precious metals. We're seeing some indicators that you could have bonds and gold predicting a spike in inflation later this year. You can see from this red line, the resistance, the S&P has been just kind of hitting that for a couple of weeks now. So the significance of that level can't be overstated. The line also represents the 61.8% Fibonacci retracement of the market decline in March. So we're back to the all-time high and it's trying to get past that, but it can't. So it's believed that if it does break out above the 61.8% retracement, that would indicate a new bull market, so not a bear market bounce. So the significance of that level cannot be overstated. So the chart appears to be indicating a major risk on move coming in the financial system. So if it breaks below the red line, it could ignite a major bull run in stocks to new highs. And gold is saying something very similar. We've had breakouts in every major currency. So this too is big inflation 
on the rise. While it might be unclear whether we continue down with the deflationary period or have hyperinflation, what is clear is that money is important. So purchasing power of currency is declining, meaning you can buy less money with currency. And that's really why I'm doubling down on precious metals. Uh, it's going to be the only money uh, as soon as this fiat currency eviscerates uh, just by overprinting itself to the point where it spontaneously combusts, catches fire, and is absolutely worthless, but invest wisely. So with that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't. And I'm out.